Uh, thank you for the introduction. Uh, so my name is Shu, and uh, this is a joint work with uh, Ryo Nishimaki, Shota Yamada, Takashi Yamakawa from uh, NTT and ICE. Uh, thanks everybody for sticking around until the last session. So as the title suggests, this is going to be a talk about uh, compact NIZKs from various assumptions. So our results can be broken up in four pieces. Uh, they're all based on uh, NIZKs, and it's about getting compact notions of NIZKs. So the first theory is going to be about short proofs. And the last one is going, about, is going to be about efficient provers. And for this talk, I'll use probably 85 through 90% of my time to uh, talk about the first two results uh, regarding short proofs. And the last 15% of the time, I'll use it to explain what an efficient prover NIZK is. So as a background on this, I I'm sure that everybody kind of saw this at some point during this uh, crypto conferences, but let me just kind of give a brief overview of what NIS was. So here, pro a prover wants to prove to the verifier that she knows a witness corresponding to the statement X in this language. So completeness tells you that, uh, well, this proof pi should verify correctly. And for soundness, what we have is that uh, it's for a cheating prover. So if she has a uh, statement which is not in the language, then it should not verify. And for zero knowledge, uh, we just say that the proof pi does not leak any information on this witness other than the fact that this statement is really in this language or not. So when you have these three properties, then you get an NIZK. So we'll be considering various types of NIZKs, and this is, I think, the one that's those, the most like um, standard one, which is called the CRS NIZK. So the trust is set up here will construct a public common reference string. And in this model, any prover or any verifier can uh, participate using this CRS. And we can consider a relaxation of this, where the trusted setup is now going to provide a private verification key for this uh, particular verifier. And that's why it's called a designated verifier zero knowledge. So in this world, anybody can be a prover if she has a witness. But the person who can verify this proof pi is only going to be this designated verifier in hold of this uh, KV, the verification key. And obviously, you can consider the opposite flavor of this, which is now the private proving key setting, which is the designated prover NIZK. And finally, you can also consider this relaxation where both of them, now the prover and the verifier, both has uh, private information. And this is called the pre-processing NIZK. So when you think about it, Let's say you're in the pre-processing NIZK and you find a way to get rid of this KP and you were able to make this public. Then you could like kind of upgrade that into a DV NISG. And from a DV NISG, a designated verifier NISG, if you get rid of this verifier secret information, then you get a CRS NISG. So you, can, you could kind of like a build up your scheme if you can get rid of these uh, components. OK, so that's the very basic uh, background. And I'll be talking about NISG with short proofs now. And this is part one of this part one, and I'll be talking about CRS NIZKs with short proofs. So the motivation for this part is that um, so far, so CRS NIZK that we know all have like proof size that are, so the proof size that has independent, independent of the like circuit size C computing NP relation requires on like strong tools. So if we want this proof size to be very small, then we want, we require IO, FHE, knowledge assumptions, or compact homomorphic trapdoor functions where these require LW assumptions. So the thing is that without using these strong tools, what we know is that the famous, let's say, the growth osorovsky sahai uh, CRS NISC, it has proof size that is lambda times the circuit size. Right? And the shortest one we know that doesn't use these kind of assumption is the one based on growth 10 at AsiaCrypt. And this requires a poly log lambda times circuit size uh, uh, proof size. So when you look at this, everything requires a multiplicative overhead in the circuit size. So the question we wanted to ask is that, can we bring this down to an additive overhead? So can we make it into a circuit size C plus poly lambda? And that's what we did this in this first part of this work. So we construct the first CRS NIZK based on a falsifiable pairing group assumption with proof size, which is C plus poly lambda. Okay. So the starting point of this work is that uh, we consider this uh, DP NISC that we proposed at Eurocrypt this year. So it's going to be based on this uh, KNYY19 construction of DP NISC, 
with short proof size based on the CDHR assumption. And this is just a non-static Diffie-Hellman type assumption, which is secure in the general group model. So this is a, a falsifiable assumption. And our approach will be, as I explained, it's going to be uh, from uh, com trying to convert this DP and NIS into a CRS NIZK by trying to get rid of this uh, designated prover, like, private key here. Okay? So this is a very, very general high-level idea that we w what we want to do here. So I'm going to make a quick review on our work uh, at Eurocrypt. So our approach was using Kim Wu's conversion from uh, Crypto18, which uh, allows you to convert any compact homomorphic signature scheme into a designated prover NIZK. So the main contribution of this work was that uh, they created, this CD, uh, created a new compact HS from a, the CDHER assumption. So following this path, they were able to get DP NISC from this assumption, the CDHR assumption. And in retrospect, what we kind of observed from this con construction was that uh, there, there seemed to be a lot of nice properties that weren't used exactly in this, in this DP NISC conversion. So a natural thought was that, uh, can we use these like, nice properties and add it to this homomorphic signature and maybe construct a CRS NIZK? And I want to tell you that this path is a little bit uh, kind of difficult. So even if you have a homomorphic signature with like extra great properties, it doesn't seem to be applicable to the CRS NISC setting. And for that, I want to explain why this Kimu conversion is only very limited to the designate prover setting. So I won't get into detail, but what, we, what the Kimu conversion does is that uh, you have, as a trusted setup, it's going to sample a secret key from the secret key encryption uh, key space. And it's going to run this homomorphic signature setup scheme. So it's going to sample a verification key and a signing key. And it's going to sign on this secret key SKE and get this signature. So the CRS is now going to be this verification key. And the prover key is going to be this SKE key and this signature sigma. And it's really not that important, but after this, uh, Kimu technique allows you to get a DP NISC using this as the CRS and this as the proving key. So now I want to s explain why this is quite difficult to make it into a CRS setting. So to make this in the CRS setting, what we have to do is that the prover somehow has to sample this on her own. But obviously, when you look at this, that's going to be pretty hard because if she samples this on her own, that means that she has to run this morphic setup homomorphic sign on her own too. So it seems that we can't use the security notion for this HS scheme anymore. So we don't get soundness. And even if there was a way to kind of get around this issue, it will still be difficult. Because now, since the uh, malicious, well, the prover is going to ru be running this whole thing on her own, then she will have to send this VK on her own too, because it won't be able to be in the CRS. And the actual verification key that we constructed in this uh, KNYY19 work uh, has size that is lambda time circuit size. So we have to put, plug this into the proof now. So we kind of lose compactness at the same time. So it seems kind of difficult to get a CRS NISC from this approach. So what we asked in this work is that, is there like an alternative notion to homomorphic signatures to overcome this issue? And that's what we basically did. So we, in our work, we formalized the notion of homomorphic equivocal commitment, which is con kind of a similar to homomorphic signature, but it requires to go around this uh, problems that I just mentioned. So the main syntax is very easy. You can commit to a key or a bit string uh, with this random R is the opening. And what you can do is that you have this homomorphic property. So you can homomorphically uh, convert this uh, commitment into this evaluated message C of K. So you have this K here, and plugging this circuit C inside, you get a homomorphic evaluated uh, commitment C. Now this is going to be a commitment to the CK. And also, you can create a homomorphic uh, opening for this commitment C, uh, taking this ran original randomness R and this circuit C here. And the informal guarantees we want from this scheme is that for soundness, uh, when we use it for the NIZK, we want this binding and hiding property, which is a very standard thing to require for a H, uh, commitment scheme. So we want this to be binding and these guys to be binding too, the evaluated commitment too. And for the compactness notion, what we require is that we want the verification complexity of this commitment C to be independent of the circuit size C. So 
uh, informally, what that means is that this commitment C and this opening randomness C, the evaluated version of these, are going to be much, much smaller than the circuit size C. And in particular, in our construction, this will be only uh, constant numbers of group elements. And using this HEC, it's really easy to get CRS NISC uh, via this Kimu conversion. Now, it's a little bit different, but the main idea is the same. So the red part is going to be the part that's different from the original one. So for the CRS, uh, it's just going to be this evaluation key. And the prover now is going to sample this SKE secret key on her own, and she's going to commit to it. Then she's going to encrypt this. Uh, so this part's the same as the original Kimu conversion. So she's just going to encrypt this uh, witness with her secret key, and she's going to construct a circuit, which on input this secret key, it was just going to compute this guy. So it's going to first decrypt this ciphertext and get this witness back and check this relation. So if this is equals to 1, then this circuit is going to equal to 1, too. So what that means is that if you homomorphically evaluate this commitment on this circuit, it's going to be a commitment on 1 now. So finally, what you do is that you just use a non-compact CRS NISC to prove that this commitment opens to 1 again. And here, we can use a non-compact, so not a short CRS uh, NISC proof, because <clears throat> the compactness uh, allows you to kind of prove this which is independent of this circuit size, original circuit size. And you just output this. So this is going to be the main construction. And in a nutshell, what happened is that we obtained an HEC from this CDHR-based HS of our previous work. And at a high level, what this provides you is that using an HEC, homomorphic equivocal commitment, you can convert any non-compact CRS NISC into a compact CRS NISC. So this, you can view it as a generic conversion using this HEC. So I don't have enough time, but uh, I'll go into the next part now, part two. It's about DV and NIS. <clears throat> so this has a different motivation now. So recently at Eurocrip uh, last year, uh, Corto, Hoffines, and us, and uh, Quatch, Rotherham, and Wix, they all presented the first uh, DV and NIS based on the CDH assumption. However, they relied on this uh, FLS NISC, which uses the graph Hamiltonicity problem. So uh, the proof size becomes very large when you try to construct a concrete uh, <clears throat> NICK from this. And essentially, it, it's going to be polynomial in this lambda and the circuit size. So the same question again. Can we make this into a circuit size C plus poly lambda? And that's why we did this in work. So we're going to base it on the same CDH assumption, but we're going to be able to get it down to C plus poly lambda. And the starting point, again, so at a high level, the, it's the same thing. So we're going to base it on this pre-processing NIZK that we constructed at, um, at Eurocrypt last year. I mean, this year, I guess. Uh, and we want to get rid of this prover key somehow. So what we did last time was that we constructed a context-hiding homomorphic Mac. And using this Kimu compiler, we compiled this homomorphic Mac into a pre-processing NIZK. So now the natural question is, it's the same thing. So can we bootstrap this pre-processing NIZK into a DV NISC by getting rid of this prover's secret information? And you might think that we can just use the homomorphic equivocal commitment here and just do that. But the thing is, we don't have that from the CDH assumption right now. So we have to go through some different approaches now. So this part of this work is getting, um, trying to bootstrap this PP NISC into a DV NISC just by using CDH. So let me just kind of uh, get into detail what, uh, what we did in the previous work for PP and ISC. So it's really not important, but uh, we had this uh, verification key. This is going to be the homomorphic MAC key, which is going to be a finite field element like this. And for the proving key, it's just going to sample the secret key again. And this is going to be the signature. It's really not important why it looks like this, but it's just the way it is. And after that, using this KV and KP, we, uh, we just do the Kimu conversion. So now, a first attempt at getting rid of this proving key is that we could sample this on our own. We just sample this k on our own and sample the sigma on our own. But you kind of see that uh, if you do this, uniquely, you uniquely define this object r vector here when s is fixed. So this r really can't be programmed in advance. So when the prover samples this, then at that point, r is defined. So we have to have a mechanism to send this r to the verifier now. Because the verifier needs this R in the verification key to kind of verify this whole thing. But the problem is, is that the prover doesn't even know what this R is because she doesn't know S. 
So R is uniquely defined at this point, but there seems to be no way to convert, well, to transform, transfer this R to the verifier. And to solve this problem, uh, we use inner product functional encryption schemes. And so we use IPFE to implicitly transmit this vector R without leaking this prover key. So what we do is that uh, in the verification key, we're just going to include this uh, secret key SKS for vector 1S. What the prover is going to do is that she's going to sample this key on her own, the prover, proving key, and she's going to encrypt this K sigma with the IPFE scheme. All right? And then after that, using this KP, she's going to just do the proofs. And for the verifier, what he's going to do is that first he's going to decrypt this ciphertext using this SKS and recover R, and he's going to run this uh, verification algorithm after that. And the main observation here is that since it's an IPFE scheme, when you take the inner product between this uh, K sigma, which is encrypted in ciphertext, with this 1S, you get R back. And when you like, work out the equation, this is, this is the R that we really wanted to transmit to the verifier. So this idea allows you to get around that uh, sending R implicitly. And as I remarked, this one key IPFE is implied by public key encryption schemes in general. So this kind of allows you to get a public key encryption scheme with, well, I didn't tell you about this part, but, but we need another, another additional layer of non-compact DVNIS to prove well form this. But this allows you to tell you that uh, if you have this non-compact DVNIS, and if you plug in a PKE there, you can generically convert it into a compact DVNIS. And um, finally, I don't have enough time, but uh, I'll try to walk you through this last section about efficient provers. So this part is quite different from the previous ones, so it's a completely different motivation again. So there are many papers regarding the efficiencies of verifiers, which are basically like SNARGs or SNARKs. And what we kind of consider in this work is that, uh, well, as far as our knowledge goes, there seems to be no paper investigating the efficiency of provers. Right, so all NIZKs has prover running time, which is going to be circuit size times poly lambda. And when you think about it, the prover can always just send the witness. So it seems a little bit of an overkill to require the prover to have this much uh, <clears throat> com uh, computation. And so the question is, can we do better than this? And uh, in this work, we show that we can do better than this. We can make this prover running time, which is sublinear in circuit size time poly lambda. And this part uh, is very easy. So the main idea is that we're just going to use laconic functional encryption, which is a tool recently proposed by uh, Quach, Wee, and Wicks. <clears throat> uh, so people who don't know what this is, it's a very strong and like a nice primitive that you can base on the LW assumption. But what it allows you to do is that when you have a circuit C, you can compress this into a digest C, where this digest C is going to be, it's going to encode this information on the C, but it's going to be strictly smaller than the circuit size. And using this digest C, anybody can encrypt a message M for this digest C and get an encryption. And the thing is that the, this running time of this encryption algorithm is going to be strictly smaller than the circuit size now. And the only requirement is that this encryption hides the message M. And here, anybody can decrypt this ciphertext with this uh, circuit C. So there is no notion of secret keys now. Uh, anybody can do this. And you will get this C of M back, only C of M back. And with this, it's very easy to get a prover efficient NIZK. So what we do is that um, in the end, so we're first going to define C as this NP relation R. And we're just going to compress this circuit C and put it in the digest. right? And for the prover, what she's going to do is that she's just going to encrypt her statement X and her witness W with this digest C. And LFE tells you that uh, this is going to be strictly smaller than the, the running time is going to be strictly smaller than, the, com, than computing the circuit C. And also, this is going to decrypt to 1. right? So anybody can decrypt this to see that it's going to equal to 1. But the thing is, we also have to append with uh, well-formedness proof with a prover inefficientness. So this could be any NIZK. And this is because this encryption is going to be strictly, uh, the running time is going to be strictly smaller than the circuit size. So we don't have to have like a compact or prover efficient NIZK here. We can just plug it in any, like let's say, growth of sahai NIZK here. And this is it. So the verifier is just going to check this proof, and he's going to decrypt this. And if it equals to 1, then he knows that it was a valid proof. 
And yet again, so this can be viewed as a generic compiler again. So if you have a prover non efficient uh, NIZK, then you could add an LFE there and get a prover efficient NIZK. OK, so this is our uh, conclusion slide. Uh, thank you for listening. Uh, questions? Uh, okay, let's uh, thank the speaker again. <laughs>